If you have your Bibles, again, I, I like to begin, I don't always do it, but I like to begin in reading um, the, the passage as a whole before we, we dive in and, and uh, look at, at some of the details, sometimes getting the bigger picture um, uh, before we camp out. And so uh, if you'll take your, your Bibles, uh, and I will be reading, um, you know, from the, the um, it's a new translation out, uh, Legacy uh, uh, Standard Bible, and um, so you're probably going to go, whoa, that's different than mine. And, and, and we're going to address some of that today, that when you look at it, there are differences like, that's not at all what mine says, and we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that um, as part of this message, and, and that may be something that, uh, it is something that we need to be, be aware of. So I'm beginning at verse 32. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests have been divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord that she may be both holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote propriety and undistracted devotion to the Lord. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. But, if, but he who stands firm in his heart, being under no compulsion, but has authority over his own, free, oh, his own will, uh, and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband has fallen asleep, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, I thank you. You address so many different situations. And, and God, help us. Help us today as we go in looking in your word and seeing how we could have complete devotion. And wherever we find ourselves in life, whether it be about marriage or singleness or, or any other, how we can show and share and by your Spirit's power to live completely devoted to you. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. To understand this passage, um, we need to look a little bit back in the same chapter. Uh, verse 17 um, starts, uh, Only as the Lord has assigned to each, as God has called to each, in this manner let him walk, and so I direct in all the churches. This was from last week. This is what we talked about. And so all of this is in context of this. And so, um, so it's like, and, and basically we're like, okay, where do you find yourself in life? And, 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 and you know, whether making the most of the situation that you are in. Um, and as, as, you know, if we have something in my house that has this nice little, nice little saying, bloom where God has planted you. Where has God placed you in life? And this is in variety of areas. This is your marital status, you know, where you find yourself right now. Where are you and how can I use that 
for your glory. Um, regarding your heritage, your past, your in, in, in every respect, your home life, your schooling, all that, how can that be used? How can I bloom with what, what I've gone through instead of complaining about it? Um, or our vocation, you know, where we find our, our work, our school, or, 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 or retirement, or where we find our place in life, how can I bloom there? How can God be demonstrated in my life through there? And so we already talked, that was last week's message. Um, and so uh, this also is from last week's message because Paul was addressing a certain situation Situation, and he says, in view of the persecution, in view of the situation that you're in, there was a unique situation that, that was going on in the, in the city of Corinth. And so, but in view of that persecution, we need to live with a recognition of difficulties. You know, because whether we're going through persecution now, we will go through persecution. Um, and so we need to make decisions in recognition of there will be difficulties. There are going to be things coming up. Um, and so there may be some things you don't commit to be in. Um, in view of Christ's return, that he will one day. You know, we keep going, when is that going to happen? You know, Paul was expectant of it coming any day. And we need to live in ex uh, ex that same expectation and living with a level of detachment from temporal situations. And again, all of this was last week. Um, you can go to YouTube and watch it. Um, and then in a view of eternity, live with a detachment of worldly stuff. Because guess what? You can't bring it with you. You know, so this was all about last week, finding the situation you are, realizing that you do need to adjust based on, on, on the situation uh, that, that you are, are in. So now... Going to this passage, and he already addressed it a little bit. He, he talks about, he compares married, I'll say versus <laughs> single life. You know, like it's this competition. Uh, so he says, okay, now then let me share. And again, realize that it is in view of the current situation that we're in. And, and also, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. And so he talks about the benefit of singleness. Now, when we talk about singleness, it might be you've never been married before. It could be that, that um, you, you were married and, and, and your spouse ha has died or there was a divorce or something like that. So you right now are single right now. So there's a benefit. There is a benefit. How can you, you bloom where God has planted you? He says here, he wants you to be free. And, and, and Paul, whether he never was married or he was married and his, his wife died, we, we don't know that story and all that, but at the time he's single and he's saying, you're freer. You are free from concern. I want you to be free from concern. One who's unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he, can, he may please the Lord. So, so you only have one concern, as we'll read just a little bit, as opposed to the concern of and a family. Um, and again, in, in light of the persecution, if you know you're going to be persecuted, if you're single, it's easier because it's just you. It's not your wife. It's not your kids. And it is, it is easier, not to say it's easy, it's easier to have a detachment. And so he's like, it's easier for Paul to be able to pick up and go and go on this missionary journey and go there and be in prison and not have to worry about his family. That's what he's saying, I want you to be free from concern. So he says, one who's unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord. So you just focus on that, how he may please the Lord. But then there's a potential for a single of undivided devotion. But the one who's married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Now listen, he's not saying that's a bad thing. He's just saying that's a fact. And his interests have been divided because it's like, okay, I can't just fully, because I've got to take care of my family, you know. You know so this is back and forth. His, his interests have been divided. The woman who's unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be both um, holy, both in body and in spirit. And so, you know, but the one who's married is concerned about the things of the world, just like the man, uh, how she may please her husband. Now this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, 
but to promote propriety and undistracted devotion in the Lord. And so he's just saying, singles, and again, however you are single right now, you have more time. You have, well, I don't know about it, you might have more money or more discretionary funds that you can, you, you have more, more discretion there. And definitely you probably have a lot more energy. How are you using your singleness? How are you using that you don't have those ties? How can you use that in the service of the Lord? Now, quick story, my story. I was 31 years old when I finally got married. I was one of those, some people go, you know, you're, you're probably one of those who can care less about marriage. No, no, no. When I turned 18, I was looking for Mrs. Robert Randall Good. I mean, I was, I mean, I'm serious. As soon as I finished high school, I'm like, where is she? Where is she? You know, and I just started that journey. And, you know, anytime I dated, I'd be going, maybe she's the one. Okay, that was me. I, I just, you know, again, some of you going, man, I wasn't thinking that one until I was, you know, whatever. You know, and so that was me and stuff like that. And listen, listen, I, it drew, okay, I was single. But I was bound to the search. Now, if I had met Candy when I was 18, I would have been arrested uh, being that she would have only been 10. But um, that's why I had to wait till I was 31. Um, <laughs> but it finally hit me when I was in seminary, mid-20s. And I started looking around at all the other single guys like me. And, and there were some single girls in the same situation. And that, it, was, it was their, you know, looking like that. Maybe, 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 maybe. And it finally hit me. I'm like, God, you may not have called me to singleness for the rest of my life, but right now you have called me single. And it totally changed my perspective. I stopped looking, and I started going, God, what can I do now that I won't be able to do as freely once I'm married? And it was, it was awesome. It was freeing. It was, it was some, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, you know, you know when situations, obviously, when the situation came up, but, but, but again, it was so freeing. And really, from that point on, I didn't date anybody until Candy. And so it was about three years, you know, of, 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 of that. So I ask you who are single, maybe recently due to circumstances and, 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 and grief and all, but God has put you in a situation. How are you using your singleness? What Paul is saying is not against marriage. Because in marriage, he doesn't go into here, he goes, it, goes into this in other passages. We will study, study on another day. But in marriage, you have the benefit of serving in partnership. I mean, listen, you know, it's just an automatic thing, you know, and, and Candy's right there, and she's like, you know, she's so willing. Um, uh, sometimes she's, she's willing in areas that I don't want her to be willing, like giving me advice sometimes and, and stuff like that. But it's always good. It's always what I need. I have a partner. And so God's put me in that situation. I had that benefit. I also have the benefit, as he says in Ephesians chapter 5, of being able to show through my marriage the picture of Christ in his church. And so there's definite benefits, there's definite ways of showing, and I'll conclude at, at the end of this message, you know, talking a little bit more about that. But, but here, here's, here's the point on this. 
really Paul is not addressing this because most people were married and there were these singles and they were going, hey, am I, am I left out? Am I left out? And he's like, no, 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 you have an opportunity. One is not better than the other. It's just different. It's just different. Now, Paul brings up a special situation. The virgins. Now, I don't know if you were reading along when I was reading the translation I was reading, and there's probably some things going, that's not what mine says. Well, let's look at that. Again, this is, this is the, the legacy, which is very similar to the New American Standard. Um, uh, but if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, what do you notice about the word daughter there? Italicized. That means all the letters are going, okay? I had a seminary professor ask a class, and I was so glad I wasn't in the class because then I could judge us in the class, but because, you know, because I might not have had the right answer. So, you know, I should know that. If you ever see, and these are more of the literal translations, if you see a word italicized, what does that mean? Now, do you know what some of these seminary students do so you don't feel so bad? It's more important? No, it's not in the original. It's a word that was added to help you understand what is being said. Sometimes it's a good addition. Sometimes it's an addition that, or it could be another way. And this is why when you were looking at and you said virgin daughter, you're going, I didn't say anything like that. So, <laughs> this is a question from the Corinthians goes back to verse 25. Now concerning virgins. Now, this is, this is used, and you know, when we started this, this whole chapter, now concerning, you know, it means he got a letter that said, what about, what about, what about? So this is one of the what abouts. What about the virgins? And you're going, you know, well, then that fall under, you know, the singles? And, and so I have no command in the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. And then he says, now because of the persecution, he goes into stuff like that. So, so this, this is when the topic is brought up of the virgins. Down in verse 34, I want you to notice something. The woman who was unmarried, we read this early, earlier, the woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord. And, you know, so we just read that. But notice, you would just think the virgins would be under the category of the unmarried. You know, and, and, and it's just interesting. They're mentioned separately. And so when the word unmarried, it's talking about those who are single, those who are widows and not remarried, those who are divorced and not, not remarried. And so that follows under. And guess what? The virgins would fall under that, but there's a special situation. So what in the world are we talking about? Who's the virgins? Okay. Who are these virgins? You know, and, and, and so, you know, <laughs> it's so funny. You're going to be talking in tomorrow, you know, to the other Christian friends who go to other churches. What What'd you talk about? The virgins. Anyway, so um, never, this is who the virgins are, never married women of marrying age. Yes, that falls under single. But there's a special situation as we dig in here just a little bit. We just read the translation that said his virgin, and they added the word to help you understand daughter. It is literally the virgin of him. And that's why other translations, him is not defined. So we don't know who him is. And, 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 and you know, so, so the, the King James and the young literal translation just say it that way. His virgin. They don't try to determine who his or him is. So, so who is him? It could be referring to the Father. And that's what the New American Standard, the, the Legacy Standard, what I just read, the American Standard Bible, translated virgin daughter. But it also could be referring to the fiancé, the betrothed of the virgin, that they're awaiting marriage. NIV 
Christian Standard Bible, the virgin she's engaged to. Uh, the New Living says his fiance. Uh, the ESV um, is his betrothed. Now, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Well, who is it? Well, you know, I am that smart. I am able to tell you exactly who it is. And all these scholars that, that had this and going, is it this or this? And how do we do it? Should we translate it? Should we, should, we, should we add that word or not and all that? I know the answer. Okay? Don't worry. I'll set you straight. I'm that smart. No, I'm not. But let me share some things that I studied. And this is where I have to say, in my opinion... Okay, because I want to make sure this is what the word says. And this is what we try to add to make it understandable. Okay, so. In that culture, a father had absolute authority over his daughter. Until she got engaged. Now, engagement is not the same as engagement today. When someone was engaged, it was such a binding commitment that it took a divorce to break it. So, during that time, the husband or the husband-to-be had absolute authority over his wife or his wife-to-be. It's both. <laughs> It says in verse 36, but if any man thinks that he's acting unbecomingly toward his virgin, again, this one's saying it's virgin daughter, if she's past her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he, what he wishes. He does not sin. Go on, girl, get married. Or, in other translations, it, it says, or someone that he's betrothed to, and because of the persecution, they're going, should we hold this off? Should we wait? Should we cancel it? What should I do? And Paul's saying, if you get married, you're not sinning. But what Paul states, in light of what Paul wrote here, The father considers what his daughter wants. That translation, if she is past her youth, can also be translated if her passions are strong. Or, or, or again, you could, you know, the groom considers what his fiance. Now, now, let me just share something here. Before this... Do you know what the fathers would have said? Because I said so. End of discussion. You're not getting married. Or the fiancé makes the determination, hey, no, well, I think it's all. He could say, because I said so. I'm that authority over you. But now, in light of what Paul is saying, Take into consideration where your daughter is, what your daughter wants. Going to the groom, take into consideration, you know, unless you're convicted otherwise, because of the present distress. And it goes on and says, okay, and we're going to go back to what I just said after. But he who stands firm in his heart is saying, okay, listen, I, it's still my decision, and I really feel this is a bad thing, okay? Okay. It is not a right time. This is whatever. He has authority over his own will and has decided in his heart to keep his, his own virgin daughter, keep her virgin, keep her not married. Now, so then he who both gives his own daughter in marriage as well, and he who does. So he's just saying there's not a scriptural says do this, do this, or don't do this. He's just saying, you know, you, you need to seek the Lord on this, but here's something else you need to seek. Paul wrote more for the cause of women. Do you know what Paul's always accused of when people read Paul today? Oh, he's anti-woman. 
He's just trying to knock them down. Keep them there. Keep them barefoot and pregnant. No, I mean, he's just, he's just, you know, keeping them down. Knock down the women. Go, you know. No, so, so. What Paul wrote here, as well as other passages, were totally against the culture. He's saying this, fathers, you're not the dictator. Consider your daughter. Consider where she is in her life. Consider her passions. Consider, that, that was totally different. And to husbands, and even the husbands-to-be, you are not the dictator. Now, again, this doesn't fly today. I mean, what do you mean? Tell, I'll go get married anyway. You know, but, but in that cult, this was huge. Consider your wife. Consider your fiancé. Think about her. Paul wrote more in his day that was totally, wow. Now, now listen, and then people take it too far. But, but, but let's, let's just look at another passage. And this is, you know, in the same vein, same thing, thought about totally different than his culture. We read it, we read it a couple, couple weeks ago. <laughs> the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also to the wife of her, uh, also the wife to her husband. What are we talking about? The physical intimacy thing that happens in marriage, okay? That's all I have to say. You can explain it to your children later. Um, the wife does not have authority over her own body. And, and again, now listen, that's nothing new. That day, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm the man and she's mine. She's property. That's how she was considered. But this next line, you know, And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his body. The wife does. That was totally, what? P, they read that and they're going, I never heard that before. An equal partner with different roles. This isn't Paul, this is Peter. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, or according to knowledge. That's why it's italicized, because it, it, it kind of changed, changed it to make it more readable. Live with your wives with knowledge. Know them. Understand their feelings. Understand what's going on. Understand where they are in life. Understand. Live with your wives in an understanding way as, as with a weaker vessel. We're not going to talk about that one today. Um, since she is more delicate. More, okay. Since she is a woman. And look at this. This is what I want to focus on. And show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. She is an equal status. You know, Paul would later on write that, that in Christ there's no male, there's no female. I mean, he would just say, listen, listen, there's a, there is an equality here. And this was totally new when Paul wrote this. Like I said, Paul did more for, 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 the, for the sake of, of, of women. And so this was a whole other thing, and Paul addresses it in this present circumstance, and you ask me, and I'm saying, dads, consider your daughters. Fiancés, consider your betrothed. Let them be a part of the decision with you. Here's a recap that the Bible gives of this whole section. The permanence of marriage. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. And also a husband is bound as long as his wife lives. Doesn't go there, but other passages say that. As we say, till death do we part. And also there's a freedom to remarry. But if her husband has fallen asleep, died, she's free to be, to be married to whom she wishes. 
only in the Lord. I want to focus on that, you know, only in the Lord. In the Lord means that they are a believer. If you're a believer, you, you don't marry an unbeliever. In the Lord, most important thing in your life, um, the most important relationship in your life should be the same thing as the most important thing in the life of your spouse. The freedom to remarry. And then, the option of singleness. But in my opinion, and, and Paul's opinion, he states his opinion, um, it, it is that, you know, hey, she's happier if she remains as she is because you're able to do more for the Lord. That's his, that's his opinion. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. And again, in the light of, the, of, of what they were going through. Let me go back to complete devotion. <laughs> because you might be going as a married person right now. I can't give complete devotion to the Lord. <laughs> But I want to give, okay. Yeah, I mean, I hope that's part of your heart. This whole passage, this whole chapter, complete devotion to the Lord wherever you find yourself in life. If you're single, take advantage of the greater flexibility to serve the Lord. If you're married, Serve the Lord with full devotion. But I thought I couldn't do that. Partly in how you show devotion to your spouse. Because that's also your job now. From the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as the, as, as the church did to Christ. That is our calling now. You want to show full devotion to the Lord? You show full devotion. You show devotion as the Lord has commanded to your spouse. Now, what did Jesus do? He did both. When Jesus came on this earth, he came fully as a human. And because of his mission, because of the focus... He was single. Could he have gotten married? I don't even need to go there. But God could do whatever he wants to. That wasn't the mission. The mission was a centered focus on, on what God the Father wanted for him. And he fully was committed to the Father's will. Now, don't go into all the stuff that you've read. Well, Jesus, I heard, was really married to Mary Magdalene. Ah, that's garbage. Okay. <laughs> he was here to do the Father's will. And he did that as a single man. But in the same light, he showed devotion to his bride. The church. That, that, that one day there's going to be the, the wedding of the bride. There's going to be that, that wedding supper. There's going to be that connection that, that God, God used this whole thing about marriage and saying, you know, so at the same time, he's fully devoted, single, doing what he did, going here, going there, going every which way and stuff like that. He was doing all that for his father, fully devoted to him. He did it for us, for the joy set before him. And that joy was one day knowing, this is purchasing my bride. This is taking care of her sins. This is going to be one day in eternity, forever and ever. And so if you're single... Live fully devoted as the Lord lived. If you're married, live fully devoted as the Lord lived. Let me ask you to pray. Father, wherever we find our place, yeah. 
may we bloom. Father, and specifically in this area of marriage, our singleness, our widowhood, are in this situation back then that's not really true today, but back then it was, it was revolutionary in, in how a father really should look at his daughter and how a fiancé should look at his, his, his betrothed and, and how a man should look at his wife so that when the world looks, they see a difference. But Jesus, it all points to you. In devotion to your Father, you set your face as flint to go to the cross. Not what I will, but Father, what you will. And Jesus, you did it unto your Father, and you did it for all who would believe on you your bride, to wash her, to cleanse her, to take away our sin. And Jesus, my prayer, if there's anyone hearing me online or, or, or hearing me here in this room, and they have yet to believe on you, that you've paid the price that we couldn't pay, we can never be good enough, but you were. And you desire us into relationship. God, that we would put our belief on you. On you, Jesus. Help us as we look at this and help us no matter where we are in life. To keep our eyes on you. The author and perfecter of our faith. I pray in your name. Amen.